Welcome to the Software People Stories. I'm Shiv. I'm Chitra. And I'm Gayatri. We bring you interesting untold stories of people associated with the creation or consumption of software-based solutions. You'll hear stories of what worked and sometimes what didn't. You will also hear very personal experiences and insights that would trigger your thoughts and inspire you to do even greater things. My guest is Raghu Vishwanathan, known as Raghu. He qualified as a statistician from the Indian Statistical Institute and became a management trainee when he started his career. He initially hated programming because he had to use these punch cards, which were not very easy to use. And how he got into the financial services and working across continents, doing different challenging projects, and how the rigor at the Indian Statistical Institute prepared him for increased confidence in many of the assignments that he had to take up the first time without too much of a background. He also talks about the importance of understanding the domain for a developer and uh, finding major lifestyle changes in young Indian professionals when he came back to India. And nowadays, his joy of trekking and how he discovered the interest in trekking like other guests, he also shares his career tips and his perspective on decentralized finance or DeFi. Listen on. Welcome to the Software People Stories, Raghu. Thanks, uh, Sivaguru, for inviting me. Well, it's something new to me too. Le let's see how it goes. Okay. Sure. I, mean, I remember our first interaction when you were actually my customer. So I thought today we will start with your origin story. Okay. How you got into software and what has been your career trajectory. Okay. And then we'll take it from there. Okay. A little bit of a context and introduction about me. So that will uh, fit in beautifully with the story. I'm an alumni of ISI in Kolkata, Indian Statistical Institute. And for people who do not know, that was the institute which got the first computer in India. It was, uh, I don't know which one it was, but when we were there, it was Honeywell 400. And it's 128K memory in those days, punch cards. And I hated computer science <laughs> because oh, no. you know how it was with punch cards. Uh, you had to go and punch the cards and compile time take, takes time. The turnaround time is one day. I said, which idiot will do all these things? I never liked uh, computer uh, saying writing programs in those days. But... You know, as part of the course, we had to do it. And I never wrote a program until I faced a uh, problem with the exam. They, had to, uh, they asked us to write a program. And the first time I had to scratch my head and uh, write a program. So that was my introduction to computer software. I'm talking about in the 70s. And you know, those days computers are unforgiving because one mistake, that's it, it's even error. Bottom line, you have to come back, you have to wait for a day. I never liked it. Anyway, from there, uh, I do not know how I landed up in TCS, but they took me as a management consultant, not as a software person. Okay. I, I joined TCS early 80, in the 80s, uh, to be precise, 81. And those days, TCS are only 2,000 people, max. And I joined in Mumbai as a management consultant, was working as a management consultant. And Sivaguru, you know how... TCS and TBL operated in those days. One day I came for a vacation to Chennai and I get a telegram that I'm being posted in the US. Mm -hmm. So I had to rush back to Mumbai and I didn't, uh, was, my passport was not ready. I know, but TCS had influence. They got the passport on the same day and I, I didn't even have to visit the US consulate. They got my visa stamp and they put me on the plane to New York. Mm -hmm. I land there not having worked in any software in TCS and they'd introduced me as an IBM expert to the client. Typical of uh, all this uh, the way TCS and TBL operated. So I go there and the very first day, there's a bigger shock for me. Not only had they introduced me as an IBM expert, but I was supposed to work in an audit department, which was uh, separate from the rest of the TCS gang. I was all alone. And to make matters even worse, they are moving from Burroughs to IBM. And they said, 
since you're an ibm expert we do not know anything about ibm you will train our staff my god i got a shock of my life i do not know what to do and they are talking about pl1 cics all these things they said you need to do that and i came back uh, and then went straight to the tcs office mahalingam was the resident manager there i said guys what have you done to me you put me in an awkward spot at least if you put me in the group i can survive as part of the group but you put me alone and these guys are telling me that i have to train them and you know tcs managers mahalingam was very rough with me he said raghu you have to do this this is what you are expected to do as a teacher staffer he said if you can't do it take the next plane and go back so uh, seriously in the night i went i said can i do this i thought to myself the so next morning like a sheepish way i go to mahalingam i said ma this is too tough you know if i fail i look bad i'll make teachers look bad send me back i told them hmm. <laughs> maha didn't expect that answer from me okay then is tone suddenly changed because i realized he is also in a tough spot he can't make teachers waste an airfare just sending a person he look bad he started pleading with me he says rogo i know you can do it no blah 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 he started i said okay now we have a deal so i said okay let me go and buy a book on pl1 let me read about it you will not believe i picked up a picked up a book from barnes and noble night i'll read pl1 morning i'll teach somebody else <laughs> so that was a story about tcs anyway i survived there they extended me at the contract stayed for 18 months so and the rest is history that how i got into uh, the thing that software uh, uh, thing and from there since tcs also liked me that they knew that i survived uh, that new york experience i came back to india they sent me to australia australia was also fantastic with high, the thing there we are doing a project in honeywell for telecom australia and you know these days we talked about agile and things like that agile devops you know everybody working together iterative thing those days things were expensive honeywell had sunk in so much money into the project without get, getting a signature on the dotted line from the client so they put in the money expecting the client would sign but it was a risk but what what fascinated me about the project they didn't compromise on the quality we didn't touch a computer for two months they said you design think through these are the specs go through all that come up a detailed pseudo code without any computer we had right we had to review it people reviewed it and pseudo code was as good as a code got based on the review that taught me that if you want to work on a good project think through all the details consult people come up with good pseudo code because then the coding was very very easy coding was done in no time there and the similar process they followed for testing so that was a nice learning experience for me in australia so from tcs then i moved to i came back i then i went to the us got a job there and us again uh, my first uh, the same job was at swiss bank as a, con- a, a contractor there one of my tcs colleagues was a manager and his boss suspected that he has brought his friend so he, they were very 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 tough on me they recruited me they said okay you answer all the things in the interview we know you're good but we want to test you and that was i did not know anything about foreign exchange because that is the foreign exchange a trading pr- platform they gave me something they said do it by tomorrow so it's credit limit something like that you know because they wanted to test me whether i really knew this or whether i was brought in by the guy i passed the test with flying colors that's it then they never bothered about me so this is how i progressed and i would say more importantly the training in isi because in isi kolkata like it's our premier institute in the field of statistics we had an exam every week which counted towards the final uh, grades and it was a grind every saturday and sunday for us to go through all this coursework prepare for the exam and as usual we as students in india we started our preparation only on saturday for the monday exam so it gave us a confidence that you know if i can handle that monday morning exam 
with just two days preparation, I can do anything in the world. So I, this is a brief introduction into my software industry. Very interesting. And uh, I can relate to some of those things. My first assignment also was in the US and I was alone. I was supposed to be with somebody. There was some miscommunication. I landed up alone. And then I next assignment was in Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, in Tasmania. But yeah, today, the story is about you. Yeah. yeah. Now, this is actually uh, quite interesting that uh, you did statistics and you had recruited as a management consultant. And then you were also an individual contributor, trainer, and then taking on various challenges. After all these years, do you like programming now? I would say, you know, I moved from uh, pure coding to management. What I like is the domain knowledge mixed with the technical knowledge. Uh, if you ask me to code, I'm an old COBOL CICS guy. From there, I've not done any of the modern programming languages, though I've gone through courses. And today, it's all about iterative programming. And I'm a little bit of an old school type, I would say. Think through. Well, even today, if you think through and do the coding properly, you save a lot. Because today, you've got a terminal. You've got, a, a, what is that? Iterate, uh, not a interactive debugging, all the same. So people don't think through. They said, okay, let me do it. Let it make the errors. And yes, they get the results. But from a design perspective, I personally feel you need to put in some thought. And again, you might call me old school and I don't find that, that happening. So maybe I will, I will not enjoy in the current environment. But you also mentioned that uh, your strength now is more on the domain. Yeah. So how important is it for a developer to understand the domain? It's very, very, very important. Like in, in, in any industry, you need to know the client, you need to know the product, you need to know how it operates in the various environment. So let me give you one example, how important it is. Okay, I'll give you one instance from my software project management life. This was happened in uh, Swiss Bank, which became UBS. I was managing a foreign exchange uh, settlement, which interface with the payment system. In the US, like uh, in India, you got RTGS. There is a chip system, clearinghouse inter interbank payment system, which sends out payments to all the other banks. And we are talking about multi-million dollar payments because this US treasury trading, the minimum they trade in uh, 5 million, 10 million. So every day, a lot of money used to go out. And our system was running on IBM. Our payment system was running on DECWAX. So there is an interface. For some reason, one, one month, we had some issues with the interface it used to go down. And the US, the Fedwire system, the payment system closed at 6 p.m. Once at 5.55 p.m., okay, I was sitting at work. Suddenly I get a message from our system support center saying the link is done. Now, if I'm purely a technical manager, I'll start analyzing that link, saying what went down, how to fix it. And since I knew the domain, I knew that if I don't fix it, what will be the implication? I ran to the trading floor. I had only five minutes. I went to the head of the treasury trader. I said, look, the link is down. You sell all the excess money. Because if I'm not able to send the payments, the pay money is sitting in our account at the Fed. I said, sell the money. And he asked me why. I said, link is down. It might take more time. It may not come. The guy, because it's a, you, we are a big bank, he sold the money in one minute. When he sold the money, that means we are selling it in the overnight Fed funds market. We're getting income out of it. I pay a penalty of overnight Fed funds. And that guy managed to get a slightly higher return. So bottom line, we didn't clear half a billion that mm -hmm. in the five minutes. He sold half a billion. He made money. Okay. So net net, our profit was actually $1,000 that day. <laughs> okay. So why I'm saying it's important to know how your system interacts, how it's used. It's very, very important. So you have been working with teams that are distributed. Yeah. Now, how do you bring in this appreciation for the domain for people who are primarily you know, techies who want to make a career in maybe a very, very niche technology? Uh -huh. See, uh, I think a lot of it has changed because of the outsourcing and offshoring which has happened. Previously, I used to recruit people to work on site uh, in various places and then tell them the importance and wherever they fail to understand and they'll come and ask me, I knew a little bit more about the domain. I used to sit and coach them. You need to think through, is this a problem? Have you analyzed here? Have you analyzed there? Through interaction, it used to happen. 
and that way it worked but i think starting after the y2k all the every company started offshoring that became a challenge because you're actually the co- uh, personal developer might be sitting some other location how do you do it so in prior to the offshoring i think uh, what helped offshoring is all the banks at least i am only uh, the same family they all the financial services the banks used to like in for a, or my own bank ubs used to operate in silos new york operation london operation tokyo operation and as the competitive pressures increase they had to globalize they said we cannot use different systems for different locations so we had to use the same system so i used to support only the us based systems and my system was chosen as a global platform for fx settlements so now suddenly overnight i had to support london tokyo singapore it became a problem for me because i used to get calls only at certain times now through the night if london because london was up and running before we even woke up there's a problem they'll page me in the night saying rago fix it so that happened i told my staff look i can't be doing all this you also have to learn so we had a team of people and then i think this enabled the globalization within the companies enabled saying hey if i can sit in new york and support system why can't i give to other places too i think that's how it evolved uh, to get this offshoring business now the challenge is when i have my own staff i can tell the importance how you have to learn what you have to do you know the support but with offshoring i think the pressures are a little different because the, the offshoring staff are being judged for something else their incentive system is something else and then how do i inculcate the same values in them a lot of people uh, again is my personal thing they drive an offshoring or any other vendor as a slave thing hey you do it i always believe in investing even in my offshore vendors tell them guys okay you do this you need to satisfy your management but you need to learn all these things then i used to coach them i used to help them as though they were my own team and i think that's very important tell them look the domain knowledge is important you need to pick up these things too and you need to support them you cannot just tell them because on their own they are never going to do it but support is very very critical in my opinion so what keeps you busy these days ah <laughs> okay uh, what happened is uh, my, i was working in financial services and deutsche bank i was in germany you know when i was interacting with hcl and then from germany i moved back to the us and my bank a deutsche bank at that time they were going through a lot of problems they cutting they said you have to move i have to move to singapore i said i just come back i'm not going to go anywhere they said sir uh, we are starting down this uh, entire thing here in new york either you are out of a job or you do search something within deutsche bank or go to singapore then i told them now nah, i'll rather think then something opened up in india i said let me go and see india how it is and they shifted me to mumbai i got a nice deal I came here and india had changed quite a bit since i left in 80, in the 80s a lot of things that happened and then when i came here i saw the lifestyle of the uh, the thing indians the uh, young indian professionals it, it was shocking and revealing to me I, i'm sort of an expat and my team junior team they're sitting in mumbai they'll call me raghu let's go and party the entrance fee in that uh, marriott in uh, mumbai in powai the 3000 rupees i used to think my god these guys i don't know how much they earn they're willing to shell out 3000 rupees to enter there i find the lifestyle had changed and then in my complex at swimming pool things have changed dramatically so i said okay let me come to india after retirement I spent a few years here i'm telling you no regrets i'm really enjoying india's progressed i live in a gated community it's more or less a western lifestyle and i go for swimming gymna at the singer a to the gym and i picked up trekking i trek in the himalayas i my fear was what i do with my free time i have no free time now talk to you i volunteer at chennai mathematical institute they have one of the premier data science programs so being an academic institute they do not know much about how to interact with the industry i tell them you know gone are the days where in the academic institutes can sit in isolation and do things on their own you have to make money you have to expose yourself so i am helping them interact with the industry so between my volunteer job at the chennai mathematical institute my other outdoor activities my life is this thing going on in a busy space wonderful but these two at least from the outside look very different in the sense the academic contributions that you are making or even the industry is a very busy life 
yeah but when you say you're trekking it's probably very relaxed or there is no pressure on time or no running behind deadlines and all that so how do you balance the two okay so uh, let me give you here also the volunteer job uh, as soon as i landed in india my classmate he was a director of chennai mathematics institute he said rogu why don't you come and help and it so happened they had a project with a subsidiary of rbi unfortunately i can't quote the name because of the uh, nda thing it was a uh, audit of their their risk models they are doing it's a very satisfying work because i knew financial services i had forgotten all my statistics my classmate he was doing all the modeling so we were doing a thorough job and they are very very happy because they said nobody has done this come up with such detailed explanations of what we are doing so at that time because i was really busy at that time reviewing all the thing chennai mathematics you wanted to pay me you know what i told them the moment you pay me you will expect some hours i said i want to come and go when i want to i don't want to be bound by certain time because if i do that i'm committing then it's not retired life so even in the volunteer job which i do i keep my own time if i can't go i tell them i'm not there so i do everything at my own pace at gym you know i do a lot of activities but i don't put pressure on myself say i have to do this i have to do that those things those days are gone and i think retirement that way been very very good makes you focus on things which you like do things at your own pace without worrying having to worry about the end goals because for me i keep telling people gym and uh, uh, all these things it's only a means to an end basically it takes time that way i don't have to think about how i'm spending time if you think okay i need to hit this goal i need to weigh, do this much weight loss then it becomes a pressure i don't <laughs> have any such things now but did you have to do any training for your high altitude hikes or was this gymming okay. and other activities sufficient the, the trekking also was by accident you know when I, my last job was in seattle and i used to go to the gym and the thing uh, exercise every day and every day i was going i got bored one day i said i can't be seeing the same people though i was enjoying it i said i need to do something different so one weekend i said i let me go some place i started walking i did not know right opposite my place i saw a notice saying mountain trail bang opposite which i didn't know existed <laughs> i went up it is a nice hike through the mountains isolated very good in trekking what happens when you go in this forest and things like that alone it makes you reflect on life because you are alone in the thing nature you start thinking what is life i started asking all the philosophical question but i enjoyed the trek since i enjoyed it i said i started going every weekend in seattle to some new mountain and one day one office colleague met me in the uh, uh, bus and she asked me what do you do on weekends i said i go trekking said, can i join she joined and very next day very next weekend she dragged me to a mountain the base camp i said i can't do that it's too high mm-hmm. she said i seen you do it you can do it i went there i enjoyed it i got hooked on to it so but in seattle it was all a day trek so now question is do i need any special training no i do not go into treks which require any technical things like pickaxes or ropes i don't do any of that thing simple walking going up the mountain it's fine and unlike what people might think going up the mountain it's not like a, a, a steep the thing where you have to have ropes it's a gentle climb and i didn't have any issues with uh, those things but with the higher altitudes yes you need to train your body and here i have to say something a secret here most of the old people we don't get altitude sickness and for a very very simple reason we do it very slowly it's the youngsters who think they can do it they go fast before the bodies can get acclimatized they are the ones who get hit with the altitude issues oh. yeah, uh, and altitude issues also essentially what i heard from a german doctor you know people who get headaches at the sea level they are more predisposed to getting altitude sickness if you go slowly going up just requires stamina what people do not know is coming down is lot lot harder coming oh, really? down is or oh, coming down is where you have to be extra careful for gravity keep pushing you you have to slow down and it's steep and one wrong step you will have a twisted ankle you require extra concentration on the way down going up you know it requires stamina you can do it slowly coming down in my opinion is always very hard so switching back to what you've experienced over the years and all this shift what would be your guidance for people who are 
considering entering IT today. And I would also like to know for those who are typically in what we call as the midlife or mid-career crossroads. Okay. See, for the youngsters who are entering the, uh, the same IT jobs from India, what I find is a lot of them lack this uh, communication skills. Well, when I say communicate, not that they can't speak English, but they're scared and uh, uh, scared to ask questions. You and I have worked in the Western world. You know, we are very shy, deference to our management. You know, we, we are scared to question them. That, I think, has to pick up more in India. In the Western world, because the way they interact right from the school uh, uh, age, it's a little different. Pure coding, I think a lot of people can do it. Okay? If you want to go up the ladder, you have to have the other skills, the communication skills, networking skills. One thing I tell them, money is not the only criteria. But when you're young, in India especially, what I find, real estate is so expensive. Everybody wants to buy a house. Because of the pressure to buy a house, uh, which is expensive, they want promotions. And if they want promotion, they say, why am I not getting, they're getting frustrated. I tell them, look, you need to think through, you need to handle your career properly. Don't go for short-term th thinking. That is, I would say, for the juniors. Because you might be technically good, but you have to pick up the other skills. Okay, you have to move around and learn a lot, real life experiences. This is my advice to the juniors. Midlife crisis, I would say, like everyone, in the midlife, you're worried about the kids, whether we have enough for retirement, do we have enough savings to send them to the best colleges, all those things. Now, life has taught me we worry too much. You know, life takes care of itself. We stress ourselves too much. You know, I used to work day and night, then I, now I look back, I say, was it really worth it? Okay. I could have enjoyed life more. I would I also have to say, thank God that my health is good. I'm able to enjoy my activities now. A lot of people, their health deteriorates because of all the stress, midlife crisis, worrying too much, you know, socializing, drinking, this thing, all the thing takes a toll on your health. And then when it comes to retirement, they're not able to enjoy. So you need to have the right balance in life. Family is important. Kids are important because you miss that uh, that part of the life of the kids later on. Time flies. You're not going to enjoy it. So I would say, don't worry too much. Okay, if you don't get a, become a managing director, it's okay. Okay, if you don't hit a, the same huge bonus, that's okay. Learn to be realistic in your life. Saying I'm not going to hit all these goals. Can I survive on my, the same with what I have? You have that attitude, little bit of relaxed attitude. <clears throat> I think life will go okay. But it's easier said than done. I've gone through that. I can say that. But when you're going through it, this advice might not uh, be easy to take. Yeah. But one more thing, at least in Bangalore, that we find is uh, people are not looking only at a job as a career. There's a lot of startup entrepreneurs. And particularly in broadly what is called as the fintech space, since you are in the banking space. Now. What? would be your thoughts on somebody trying to start up or create jobs for others? Frankly, I do not know much about startups. So uh, I, I may not be qualified to comment on that. I admire people who are taking these risks because you don't know whether there's going to be light at the end of the tunnel. Okay? You're sacrificing your current life, your current comforts to go into some unknown. I really admire them. It may work, it may not work. You, you have to put in all your hard work. And these are just ideas, okay? You might hit the jackpot or you might go down the drain. So the very fact that the people with other commitments are willing to take this risk, that itself is a really admirable thing, FinTech. Now, in the FinTech space, so many things have come in. The new payment uh, models, the way real-time information is available, the credit, uh, the thing, so much is there. Now, I only want people to Think a little bit more. If you want to get in the fintech, do your own research, okay, before jumping in. Just because somebody tells you, jump in, okay, saying, ah, there's money to be made, then you'll be disappointed. Do your research, do your homework, okay? No, is there a, a market segment that will handle my ideas? Have some ideas before you get in. But the very fact that you're taking risk, that itself is an admirable thing. That's reassuring. Yeah. And one specific thing, I don't know whether... Uh... That's again your area. Today, people talk about DeFi or the decentralized finance, blockchain and other technologies, which 
are supposed to be kind of you know the giant bank killers you have any thoughts on that see what is a blockchain let's put it this way you and i are the old school uh, maybe we learned it it's just a multi phase commit in a database we had a two phase commit between the transaction system and the database system whereas here it's a huge distributed database around the world it has to commit everywhere i'm very putting very very crude terms what a blockchain technology is now this blockchain okay i'm separating out the bitcoin part of it from the blockchain i'm mm-hmm. only talking about the underlying technology mm-hmm. it's very good okay especially for instance in our indian system real estate registration there's a lot of fraud which is happening here where if i know i picked up a real estate it's committed everybody has the same record that will be very very useful can we exploit that is it scalable okay those are the questions i have how how much scalable uh, scalable it is wow rather than a public blockchain can it be a private blockchain for instance only amongst the real estate agencies now i do not know where where the things are headed but everybody is talking about it everybody is trying to put money into it but this talk has been going on for quite some time okay especially the security settlement space where it takes t plus 2 t plus 3 and things like that can shorten the life cycle of the security settlement will it happen through a public blockchain where it has to be a multi phase commit can it be scalable that's my key question but if it's restricted to a few players if the commit is happening within that maybe it's workable it's promising technology there there are concerns for me as far as the scalability is concerned but that will happen or not i do not know yeah i guess in the financial industry the governance becomes very critical yes very very critical yeah a good drago on that note i think that's about all the time we have for this conversation okay uh, hopefully we will get to talk about some more things particularly your interests and how you've been applying what you learned in the corporate to probably a, a hiking strategy i don't know maybe yeah. that's for another conversation wonderful nice talking to you shiv guru thanks okay. thanks you are most welcome okay. thank you bye We thank Siddharth for the music and Anita for promoting the software people stories. If you like this episode, please subscribe on your favorite podcast client and spread the word in your network. If you would like to share your story, contact us at podcast@pm-powerconsulting.com.